Hi. Okay. So we're going to continue our lecture with Chapter 11, Nutritional Assessment. Nutritional status is the balance between nutrient intake and nutrient requirements. It's the balance between nutrient intake and nutrient requirements. The balance is affected a lot of times uh, by physiologic, psychosocial, developmental, cultural, and economic factors. And we all know that those things can affect whether or not a person it does have the correct balance of nutrition in their life. Psychologically, they could be, or, or developmentally, they could be going through some problems. They could be depressed. Um, a person could be in pain and not hurting, or they could have some type of deficit or something going on with their body Why they aren't taking in nutri nutrients the way they are supposed to. Um, developmental. Let me give you an example. A child is totally dependent on their caretaker, infant, for them to eat. So you can see somebody taking stuff. Certain cultures, the way they eat may affect how well their nutrients are. Uh, people may be on a certain or a particular diet, and it may be related to their culture you know why they eat what they eat and then also economic is really a big thing sometimes people have even told me before that uh they might buy food that is not as healthy because well they have it in they in their mind that the healthier foods are more expensive and they feel like they can't afford to buy some of the healthier foods like fresh veggies and that type of thing, which I kind of don't quite agree because I've even kind of mapped that kind of thinking and I've gone to the stores and various places like that and I found uh, that um, there's really no uh, real, real big difference in the price of healthier food. So, just saying that there are a lot of reasons why people may have inadequate nutrition. But as a nurse, it's our job to try to promote adequate nutrition. And you do that because when a person is healthy nutritionally, it can basically get away uh, uh, rid of a lot of ailments that a person has so nutritional assessment since we're in the assessment class we're talking about how you assess and how you uh figure out uh what nutritional assessment is Nutritional status refers to the degree, like I said earlier, of balance between nutrient intake and nutrient requirements. And like I said earlier, and I gave you examples of all those uh, factors that physiologic, psychosocial, developmental, cultural, and economic factors, I gave you examples of every last one of, of why. Uh, the, this balance that you're supposed to have that's supposed to be equal you're supposed to have equal intake to equal uh requirements so what you put in you should equally uh put out whether that be from elimination voiding bowel movements combination of burning calories and that type of thing and that's a hard and difficult thing for a lot of individuals to do. So, optimal nutrition is achieved when 
And I'm, 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 I'm urging you to remember this. That it's achieved when sufficient nutrients are consumed to support day-to-day -day body needs. And any increased metabolic demands due to growth, pregnancy, or illness uh, is applicable when you talk about achieving uh, optimal nutrition. So you may have to uh you may have to uh follow that when you're talking about receive uh, uh doing optimal uh uh or achieving optimal uh nutrition. I can give you examples. Persons having optimal nutrition status are more active, they have fewer physical illnesses and live longer than persons who are malnourished. Um, there are different individuals who you may want to look at factors that affect their nutrition. And if I go past uh, my slide, and sometimes because when it's on my mind, right when I'm speaking it, I tend to say what I'm going to say. Uh, like, for instance, you have different people in categories and i'm just gonna skim up two or three slides just to make sure okay so that um i can't go uh let me see uh yeah i can go and i can speak on what i want to speak on on this page uh optimal nutrition um Especially when you look at people like adolescents. Adolescents are, they going through a lot. <laughs> they uh, generally um, uh, present with like rapid physical growth. And then not only do they have rapid physical growth, which means that demand is high, they have hormonal changes going on um, as well. And as so as a result of that, their caloric and protein requires increase to meet this uh, demand. With females, it could be because of their menses cycle and uh, calcium and iron uh requirements uh a lot of times uh certain factors for them where they'll be under nutrition is or maybe over it may be because of the fact of the type of lifestyle they're living where they may be working uh they may skip meals uh uh adolescents like to do fast food joints uh they may be experimenting with uh, uh 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 drugs and or alcohol so all of those stuff can be a risk for things like obesity and that type of thing in general boys tend to grow taller and have less body fat than girls uh uh because usually what happens is females they have a body fat increase of about 25%. And then the males, um, uh, only about 12% 12 because of the fact that um, they tend to have more muscle mass. So we think about adolescents, uh, uh, girls, they usually double their weight between the ages of 8 14. And uh, I mean, children tend lately they say they over uh tend to be decreasing as far as their activity level, which can lead to obesity because there's more video games being played. Um, they say that the, about a third of students tend to watch greater than three hours of television per day. Um. There is, and they're less physically active. I remember when I was coming up, we used to 
ride bikes for miles and miles. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I see some children on bikes, but I don't see children. And I know a lot of it is because of the way that the world is now. And people have to be more careful about how you're doing things. You don't want nobody to snatch your child. Not saying it didn't happen later, but I, you know, it uh, back in the day when I was coming up, but it just wasn't quite as many cases, you know. So you have to watch that, and because that kind of stuff, you know, it, it contributes uh, to them having a uh, 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 high blood pressure and sleep apnea, asthma, all kind of problems with obesity. Then if they get uh, fat and they have obesity growing up, then they got problems with their self-esteem and they get depressed and they have a decreased quality of life. So you have to take all, like we say, we always going to do the whole person. We always going to think about how every move everybody makes affects the whole person. Pregnancy and lactation, of course, when you talk about a person, that contributes to an increase of calorie, proteins, and vitamin needs so that you can have a proper development of the fetus. And um, usually uh, they recommend, uh, most obstetricians, that a woman gains anywhere between 25 to 35 pounds during her entire pregnancy. Um, and, um, and then it's significant, it's a little bit about 10 pounds or so more for some woman if she's an underweight woman. And then 15 to 25 pounds if the woman tends to be uh, a little bit more obese. Uh, during adulthood, um, there are uh, uh, different lifestyle factors that may affect nutrition, stuff like smoking cigarettes, stress, uh, lack of exercise because you've got into the uh, rat race during adulthood. Uh, these are times when people uh, tend to come into their own and then they start uh, uh, understanding what uh, type of chronic diseases they might have been prone to. It all comes up when a person is in, is in commitment to consider adulthood. And they may develop what they call metabolic syndrome as a result. You know, uh, and I know a lot of y'all probably don't know what metabolic sy syndrome is, but I'm going to tell you. And you may need to take notes on this because I might have a question on metabolic syndrome. But metabolic syndrome uh, is when people have elevated blood pressure, uh, elevated glucose level, or sugar level, and that's after they have actually not ate. You know, they fast. Uh, elevated triglycerides, which is the fatty or the bad part of the cholesterol, increased weight circumference. You know how we all get to uh, look good when we get older. And low high density lipoprotein. Low high density lipoprotein is part of the cholesterol as well. Also, and that's called the H. DL. So you got a, 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 a low HDL, and that's good fat, you know. Uh, the triglycerides is the bad fat. So that's elevated, the triglycerides, which is the bad fat. And then the good fatty stuff um, that you might get from nuts and peanuts and that type of thing is. Uh, actually uh, low, you know. So we need to uh, know what those type of things you look at, those five uh, markers, blood 
Precious, Blue Coast, Triglyph Ride, HPL, and Fat Waste. And those things are what make it a greater risk for people who uh, basically have um, a, a, a greater risk for people to have cardiac disease and that type of thing. Now, older adults have an increased risk for them being under nutrition. And that may be because, be because they got poor physical health or mental health. They might have dementia. Maybe they're isolated. Maybe they got alcoholism. Uh, the way they function and stuff is lessened. Uh, money problems and polypharmacy. Them taking a lot of little different drugs. That all can contribute to them being a uh, 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 lower, a uh, 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 higher risk for undernutrition. And undernutrition, on a certain level, like I tell you, because I love my old people, less is more. And because you're not as, act, as active, because you may be older, you really, really truthfully don't need to be carrying as much weight as you was carrying when you were in regular adulthood before you crossed over to the threshold because that puts more pressure on your organs, that puts more pressure on your musculoskeletal system and that type of thing. And so you may want to, and because normal things that happen to people that are aging is stuff like this and you got to know uh what type of things you're going to watch for okay these are things that happen to people not saying they're good things but when people get older things happen to people like poor detention detention means that their teeth and their mouth and they have problems with chewing uh, decrease visual acuity, the ability to uh, see well, decrease uh, saliva production, slow GI motility, decrease GI absorption. You'll find a lot of older people are obsessed with having a bowel movement because a lot of times they stay constipated. Um, and diminished uh, ability to uh, smell, so diminished olfactory and taste sensitivity. All of those type of things contribute. Most things uh, contribute. Uh, most things uh, contribute to when when you talk about old people. This is how I want you to remember it. I want you to remember it by saying everything is less. So their GI is less. They, and there are some things that increase, like wrinkles increase. But I'm just saying most things with older people generally decrease. Their functional level decrease. Uh, the ability to do things decrease. So sometimes you can look at that. So you need to be trying to put things uh, uh, that are uh, given foods that are put down the protein. And that comes from this food, food that contains vitamin D and calcium, food like milk, meat, cheese, and peanut butter. Those type of things help them. So you need to keep that in, uh, uh, in mind. Uh, also, uh, another word for loss of muscle mass because you naturally you lose muscle mass um, you, and you develop more fatty, even though you're supposed to get uh, smaller and you're typically a little bit more frail because uh, it decreases your, your quality of life, usually decreases somewhat in your muscle strength is called sarcopenic obesity. S-A-R-C-O-P-E-N-I-C. Sarcopenic obesity. 
that means um, that you have replaced the muscle mass with the fat. And they might still be a lot smaller. And sarcopenia means that you are that you lost muscle mass. The sarcopenic obesity means that you kind of you increase your body fat and you decrease your muscle mass. So you need to do things like weight training with older people or uh, because they're so sometimes they may have uh, problems with um things like um you know they can't maybe run no more because maybe of they they have their muscles on is I mean their muscle or skeletal system the bones may not be as massed you may tend to want to have them do things like uh some type of cardiac fist but they say aerobic exercises are the best for them and things that are non weight bearing like swimming and that type of thing so uh three times two to three times a week in that gym or uh even at home see if you can kind of make it a part of their life under nutrition under nutrition under nutrition occurs and i know it seemed like i'm moving past the slides kind of slowly but there's a lot of things involved with that I, and a lot of thoughts and things that i needed to bring to you when it comes to nutrition uh but under nutrition occurs when nutrient intake is inadequate it's not enough to meet the day-to-day -day needs or added metabolic demand so vulnerable groups are infants and children pregnant women uh immigrants people with low incomes people with hospitalized people aging adults and as a result uh they have impaired growth and development uh that makes them more prone to uh catch infections and diseases uh when you don't have enough protein and caloric intake if you had a wound or a scratch or a cut believe it or not um you tend to heal in a slower period of time and then longer hospital stays and of course as a result of you staying in the hospital longer you have a uh, increase uh hospital costs Overnutrition is when and i want y'all to know how this sounds and i want you to pay attention of how i'm saying it it's caused by the consumption of nutrients nutrients especially calories sodium and fat in excess of what the body needs so in other words the amount of burning off of the, that caloric intake is not as much as what you're taking in and so major nutritional problem today overnutrition can lead to obesity and it is a risk factor for heart disease and high blood pressure type 2 diabetes stroke gallbladder disease sleep apnea you'll find there's a lot of people who are overweight that have sleep apnea how many people do you know that have a cpap machine where they'll stop breathing in the middle of the night when they're asleep and they need that sleep apnea machine and then when they lose if they was to lose a lot of weight all of that would go away certain cancers and osteoarthritis so um that i mean all of that is huge when you think of uh nutritional status uh over nutrition continue estimated 17 percent of children and adolescents ages 2 to 19 or over have overnutrition 66 percent of adults in the U 
you as for either overweight or obese. Now, we think we just a little chunky, but we're considered like, you know, like I may look at myself and I say, well, I haven't met the threshold by my BMI as obese, but I'm slightly overweight. I could drop a 20, you know. So for adults, overweight is defined as a BMI of 25 or greater. Obesity is defined as a BMI of 30. So it's really, really important that uh, you know about this with the uh, BMIs and that type of thing. And I think we did go over there that slightly. I think we talked about that when the body mass index, when we were talking about, um, I think I went over it briefly when we was even going over vital signs because of the fact that a lot of times when people have, uh, they do vital signs, they tend to uh, take a person's um, weight. So remember I told you guys that the BMI, I want to have to know this, uh, interpretation of for adults, uh, underweight, I told you was less than, uh, basically it's 18.5, less than 18.5, I told you I'm 19 by my slide, but the book will always, um, override what I'm trying to tell you, uh, normal weight, 18.5 or 18.6 or 24.9, is considered a normal weight. Overweight, 25 to 29.9 BMI. Obesity, uh, 30 to 39.9. And then greater than 40 is considered uh, extreme obesity. So you need to know about that. Okay? Now, how do you calculate a BMI? Which is the body you take the weight in kilograms. How do you derive or get at the weight in kilograms? Does anybody know? Well, the weight divided by 2.2. Two. If you divide whatever you got in pounds, um, I'm sorry, if you if you divide whatever you have in pounds, like let's say that you are a uh, hundred and fifty pounds. Let's say somebody's a hundred and fifty pounds. Okay. Now listen to me clear. Let's say you are a hundred and fifty pounds. And then you divide it by 2.2. You will be 68.18 kilograms. So that's how you calculate kilograms. Now, in order to get pounds, you do just the opposite. You take the kilograms and you times it. by the 2.2. So, if you had a weight and your weight was a uh, 68.1 kilograms or really 68.9 if you round it up, but if you was 68.1 kilograms uh oh, I was going to say 68.2 because I'm, I'm going to say 68.2 because I'm going to round it up, which is 150 pounds, okay? And uh, I'm doing it here so we can all think it through together. So if you are 68.2 kilograms, 
then you times that by 2.2, you got 150.04. See what I'm saying? So that's 150 pounds. So use that 2.2. Always know that kilograms numbers will be less than the pound. So how do you calculate BMI? You calculate the BMI by taking uh that weight, the weight that you got in kilograms. over the height in meters. Um, the way that you do that is you look at hold tight with me. Um, pet, uh, in chapter 9 under the, the vital signs there is actually a chart and then back uh, you can come up with um, or you can use the table and you can tell what somebody's be uh, my is and you can also go on the National Institute of Health website and they got some type of. Now, if you want to do it the uh, real easy way, you will take the weight in pounds. So I told you that person was 150 pounds and divide it. by the height in inches so like let's say that a person is six feet tall and so that will be 72 and that will leave you with 2.08 times 7.03. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I didn't, uh, when I did my, uh, when I did my Titan in inches, I didn't, I did not do the, uh, over two. So, or squared rather. Okay. So, I'm going to do it again. The person is 150. And let's say that they are. 150 times. But I think I must be doing something wrong. But I know I'm not going to have you try, have to figure it out. But like if they're 60 inches and. I, I, and I had even put 
that the person was gonna be um the person BMI as a result is gonna be real real low because I I would have to do it with somebody I mean it's gone they're like extremely underweight so like if I had somebody that was uh 60 inches for instance five feet and that person oh i did i said 72 they would have a bmi of like 132 which i mean they would have that height they will have a body weight, I said, of 150-ish. So they BMI will be 22. So if a person was 70 and they had a weight of, they BMI will be about 25, about 20.5, which means that that person, they consider them normal, but me, myself, I can't see nobody uh, being six feet and weighing 150 pounds and they on the low end of normal because to me, uh, I would consider that underweight because you have to be uh, under 18.5 or 19 in order to be. So they saying that if you are a uh, uh, If you are somebody who weigh a certain thing and it's, um, let's say, they're trying to say, okay, so I did get distracted, sorry. So, um, anyway, so what you do is, like, you would take the weight in pounds, uh, divide that by the height in inches so if they were six feet uh they would be uh 72 inches and then you would square that and then so whatever that square root of 72 inches is you would uh divide the weight and then you would times it times 703 and that was how you would come up with the bmi, BMI. Uh, I am more concerned with you guys knowing just what the range is. Like if I give you a person that got a particular weight, uh, I would expect for you just to know uh, based on their weight and based on their uh, height. And then I will tell you their BMI is X, Y, and Z. Because most of the time what happens is people end up just truly just using the chart to assess the BMI and look based on, you know, like the height is this and the weight is that. So uh, as long as you know, like what the range is, is, if somebody tell you they got a BMI of 17, you'll know that that individual is underweight. Okay, so when immigrants arrive in the United States, other factors contribute to their nutritional problems. Of course, they face with unfamiliar foods. They may be eating something that they are just like not accustomed to eating. You know, so as a nurse, it's really, really, really important for you to uh, connect with that person and find out what's familiar types of foods with them so that uh their traditional foods and habits are not disrupted even though there may be a deficiency you can still introduce them to other things to add on with their traditional foods and help them twerk how they're going to uh eat or uh how they're going to enjoy whatever type of native food that they're accustomed uh, to taking. 
or uh, accustomed to uh, eating. So that would be like a very important thing to do. Uh, that would be a very good way uh, to, you know, assess a person. So you can also use what they call the weight to uh, weight to hip ratio when you and then the skin fold thickness uh, around their abdomen uh, to see whether um, a person basically uh, is considered an overweight, you know, because if that's one of your functions of the skin, if you grab the fold of skin on the skin and move on the skin, the you know, uh, uh, if you put two of the skin back and they have this little machine that you measure uh, the BMI, it's, uh, uh, they got a bioelectrical uh, analysis and they got a dual energy x ray, which is a dextra. And that measures body mass and bone mineral uh, density in a person. So they do have ways uh, to assess, you know, whether or not uh, somebody uh, is, they, you know, like within uh, the weight that they are supposed to be. So uh, there's different ways that you can assess uh, that type of thing on people. Uh, so, um, as I say, as an example, Japanese immigrants to the United States have increased risk of colon and breast cancer as they adapt to a diet higher in saturated fats and cholesterol. Because a lot of times you'll see a lot of Japanese people or where they are not. And not just Asian people, because you have Asian people from all over uh, that uh, fall up under that category. And what you'll find is a lot of them people are some, like, for instance, uh, people who are native in Hawaii or something like that. They may tend, they, they have diets that have like more fatty foods and pork and that kind of thing. So they may tend to be a little bit more chunkier than somebody that come from Japan. Okay, so cultural heritage also plays a role in nutrient needs. Best way to learn about the eating patterns of people is to talk to them. And um, Southeast Asians are often shorter and weigh less than Western counterparts. See what I'm saying? So standard tables of weight for age, height for age, and weight for height may not be appropriate to evaluate growth and development of immigrant children. A lot of times people are denser and they may look like they hard as a rock and they may weigh a lot. I remember they used to do the little charts when we was in school and uh, a lot of kids didn't meet that weight because they was denser and it didn't look like they had a, a bone of fat on them. Culture factors that must be considered is the cultural definition of food, frequency and number of meals eaten away from home. Uh, they say that people do better when they tend to eat at home. Form and content of ceremonial meals and amount and types of foods eaten and regularity of food consumption. There are some people who may say, I just eat once a day. And then you'll look at them and say, well, she looks kind of chunky, but you might want to say to yourself, well, what, what is she don't exercise? And then you may say, well, when she is eating, how is her portions? You know, portion size plays a big, I have a problem and uh, I didn't start trying to use a smaller plate, you know, to put on my plate because it's not so much with me the junk food as it is the portion size. Okay, 
Lactose intolerance is a condition found in 30 to 50 million Americans. As we know, a lot of people are lactose intolerant. Um, and a lot of times it's people of color. African Americans are up to 80% of African Americans are lactose intolerant. Um, I remember when I had my son and I decided I wanted to put him on formula and stuff. I couldn't put him on just regular milk because he would throw it up. He was lactose intolerant. Uh, American Indians, 80 to 100 percent of American Indians and 90 to 100 percent of Asian American. Uh, lactose intolerance is least common among people of Northern European descent. So knowing people's practices related to food enables you to suggest improvements or modifications. So you got to know what they do. Muslims fast from dawn to sunset during month of Ramadan in the Islamic calendar and eat only twice a day before dawn and after sunset. Okay, so the sunset, they don't eat, they go all day. And I've known some Muslims and they do that when they going through Ramadan. Jewish observe a 24-hour fast on Yom Kippur, and other times they only eat kosher foods. Christians, a lot of them do not eat meat. I, I misspelled meat on Fridays. And then halal is a term that prefers to Islamic dietary laws, and they prohibit also pig meat is one of many dietary laws they have. So that's just little little items. And if you're unsure and stuff, um, you can ask them, do they have any food preferences? If it's like the first time you meet a, a, a particular uh, patient or something. The purpose of a nutritional assessment is basically to identify uh, people who are uh, malnourished or at a risk of development of malnutrition so they provide data for designing a nutrition plan that will prevent or minimize development of malnutrition establish a baseline data for evaluate efficacy of nutritional care okay so there's very it's methods for collecting current dietary intake information uh when um uh, the information is uh, uh, available. So there are different ways that you can do nutritional uh, intake. And I want you to be able to distinguish why would you use these different ways. Okay? So, for instance, a 24-hour recall, um, they complete a questionnaire and they are supposed to recall every single thing that they have eaten in a 24-hour period. And what that does is it elicits, what, what it do is it make you know what types of food they was eating on in that 24-hour period. You know, and you can make error, so you want to know what specific type of food they eating when you do a a a a, a twenty four hour recall, and it could be a problem. And sometimes because sometimes people forget everything they ate in twenty four hours, and. <clears throat> And then, too, another thing that could be wrong with the 24-hour recall is, is that it could have been something going on where they're not eating like they normally uh, eat, you know. Uh, then um, sometimes they may uh, alter or not tell you the truth about what type of food they eat. And then... If they are one of them type of people that 
snack a lot or whatever, and they think that that's the reason why you asking them, they may just sort of kind of forget that they had that snicker bar. So those could be what problems that you could run into. But you just, when you're doing a 24-hour recall, you're just trying to see what is the specific food that they eat. Not so much even as much, but what specific food. When you do a food frequency questionnaire, you want to know uh, how many times per day or week or month the individual eats particular food. And um, so you want to, them to tell you how many times. And um, there is, of course, a prop could be a problem with that. Even though you may know how many times a day they ate stuff, you may not know exactly how much. Because I don't know if somebody's going to say, oh, I ate a whole bag of Doritos or I ate one Dorito. So all of that kind of, and then a food diary uh, probably is next to direct observation and looking at somebody. Uh, what you do is you ask the individual or family member to write down everything they consume over a period of time. And it's the most, that's why it's the most, they're keeping the note as they go along. And that's the why uh, the food diary is probably, you know, like the most accurate type. It's the most accurate. Okay. And usually when people are in the hospital, you take what you call an intake and output on a person. And based on what they're eating, you know, you'll come in and you'll say in middle of the years they ate this or they ate 75% of their food or they ate. And it's a good way for you to um be aware of what they're doing. This right here is the recommended uh, and choose my plate dot gov. Uh, you can go to that website http forward black backslash forward backslap slash www.choosemyplate.gov and it'll tell you what is considered an ounce of this what is considered and it'll tell you what you're supposed to eat as far as your daily uh intake okay so when you charting and you look uh and you write down what you see about a person, you're going to observe their general appearance, uh, and you're going to write whether or not they're obese, uh, cachectic, which means basically they have fat and they have muscle wasting, uh, or edematous, which means swollen, and is there anything that you could tell about their general appearance? Don't be like, my opinion is this. When you chart something or you write something, you only write exactly uh, what you what you know to be possible. Like, you never write the person appears to be this. You just give them the fact. And if somebody want to have an inference or come up with a type of conclusion about it, they can do so. Uh, we already talked about BMIs, um, body weight as a percentage. When it comes, uh, about 80 to 90 percent of what they should weigh, uh, they got mild, malnutrition, 70, 80 percent moderate, and less than 70 percent of what they should be, uh, as far as weight by whatever uh, various charts or whatever you use and you can use those to see whether or not somebody is overweight or uh, or severely uh you know with the malnutrition uh waist to hip ratio greater than 1.0 or greater than men 0.8 and women indicates uh obesity 
Waist Surf Conference, uh, greater than 35 inches in women and greater than 40 inches in men equal uh, increased risk for heart disease. And we're talking about the waist, how much in inches around your waist is. Neck for the sleep uh, apnea, they got seven be uh be uh they got seventeen inches in men, fifteen inches in women, and with hypertension, uh they're more prone for obstructive sleep apnea. Skin folds above or below ten percent suggest under or overnutrition, and upper arm circumference below tenth percentile or above ninety fifth percentile. And you have to take in consideration people's actual, actual, uh, what they have going on with themselves. You know, you have to, how their body is made up, all of that kind of stuff. Glucose fasting, uh, greater than 126, uh, make a person uh, abnormal. That means that you stop eating or drinking anything after midnight. You went and got your blood and it said that your blood sugar was less than 126. That's what you want. Now, the good thing is a A1C. The A1C is a blood, a hemoglobin A1C for type 2 diabetes uh is used because a lot of times what used to happen is that people would especially if they was already a diabetic they and they would go in and they would check their blood sugar at the doctor's office or have them go to the lab and they'd be fasting well they would eat they would do everything right right before they went and then it would show well my fasting blood sugar was only 80 but all the rest of their month, they had been eating everything they wanted to eat. So when you do that A1C, if it's greater than 6.5, there's a, it's indicative you got uh, them having type 2 diabetes. The reason why 6.5 is because that A1C measures when they draw that blood basically how your blood sugar been you can't hide from it has been over the last two months or so so i've seen people with a 10 a1c 11 a1c which means that they run high blood sugar all the time hemoglobin and hematocrit about iron deficiency Women less than 12, the hematocrit 36. Usually women run 12 to 16. So you don't want it under 26. Usually uh, women run 37 to 47 for the hematocrit. Okay. Men 14 to 18. And I'm thinking it's 20. It's, um, let me see. 24 to 38 or uh, i mean let me see oh my god 14 i know it's 14 to 18 uh and oh i, I lost my train of thought on men what the range is for the hematocrit but i know the women is 37 to 47 and i'm thinking the men is somewhere like um uh, um uh, 38 to wait 40 to 52 or something i know it's a little bit higher and the lipids remember i was telling you about the bad cholesterol the ldl you want it uh if it's greater than 130 that means that they got uh uh a problem with their uh tri with uh with their um cholesterol. 
the HDL, you want it less than 35. If it's less than 35, that means they're not getting enough of that good fatty. And then triglycerides, you want them, if they greater than 150, because that's the bad fat. If they greater than 150, you they eating too many fat. So that's, just know that the LDL, you want the LDL to be low. You want the HDL, which is good, to be higher. And then you want to try glycerol, which is the fatty. The LDL is the bad cholesterol. The HDL is the good cholesterol. The triglycerides is the bad fat. So that's why it's saying that you got a problem with lipids if any of these things are going on. And the same thing goes for albumin, uh, transferrin, all of those labs, uh, you know, it's best to know and uh, what they are. Remember earlier I talked about all these things that, cons that contribute to that metabolic syndrome. Remember I told you the fat stomach, the blood pressure, the triglyceride, the bad, I mean the good uh, HDL, good cholesterol, less than uh, 50 in women or less than 40 in men. The uh, glucose greater than 100, that type of thing. Those are the things where you look, at, those are the one, two, three, four, five things right there that contribute to metabolic syndrome. So that person has got like a lot going on. I just want y'all to know the categories, okay, and uh, those ranges. Okay, so. Here is a, a example of somebody that did a, a SOAP documentation. And remember I told you the S stand for subjective, the O stand for objective, the A uh, stand for assessment, and then the P uh, stand for plan. So uh, it's talking about under S. It's everything that they telling you, they said they ain't got no food allergies, they say they don't smoke or use alcohol or illegal, they exercise, they telling you all these dis different things that are wonderful. And then you put what they height is, you put what they weight is, they got a great BMI, okay, right, okay, it's right there in the middle. Uh, the lab show no hyperlipidemia, so no fatty. Fasting glucose is 100. That's good. It's below that 120. And everything is stable and within normal. And so your assessment is, based off of all this stuff that you see here, is that the patient is well nourished and they continue to eat a variety of foods following my plate guidelines. So that's how you would show it. And that would be it. Um, I don't think that I have anything else, you guys, that I really want y'all to know. Uh, y'all might want to know, uh, oh, uh, I do I can tell you this. Uh, when you talk about nutrition, know the difference, you guys, between Marasmus, which is protein calorie malnutrition, and um, uh, quite short core, which is protein malnutrition, because protein malnutrition and protein calorie malnutrition are two different things. Because when you see somebody with protein calorie malnutrition, what happens is it's like those little babies that you see on the uh, pictures and they have all this, uh, they look very, very skinny and wasted away. 
that like on them commercials and then when um they uh have protein malnutrition they might which is quashore core they may um look like they well nourished but they might be a little bit swollen or what they call a dimity. They might even be fat and still be uh, malnourished. Because remember I said that a lot of times that fat can replace. That fat can replace, you know, uh, what they're doing. Uh, 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 the protein that they need in their uh, body. So you want to know uh, the difference uh, between that. Also. Um, uh, to speak some more, I'm trying to think if, um, there's something else that I may be missing. Oh, uh, a sign of, uh, scorbiotic gums, which means that your gums are swollen, ulcerated, that comes from vitamin C. And sometimes your gums deficiency. Sometimes the people gums will actually, actually, you guys, scorbutic gums, scorbutic gums. That's what it's called. Their gums are red and ulcerated. That comes a lot of times from vitamin C. Then, uh, rickets, which were basically uh um uh, they have a uh, enlarged growth of um of their leg you know growth plates and they're curved in that's usually a, a sign of vitamin d and calcium deficiency in children bitot spots Bitot spots is when you look at the cornea, which is like the black dot in a person's eye, you might see a, a drine in the conjunctiva, which is the little pink part up under the eye. And you might see some little white plaques in the little uh cornea of they eye the black part you may see or uh the 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 i mean like the shield not the pupil but you may see in the cornea they eye little white little spot that look that's vitamin um a deficiency and i'm telling you guys this just in case Cause I'm trying to think of stuff that I want to make sure that uh we kind of sort of talked about, okay? Sometimes a person I have a real pink, pinkish, even purple kind of um tongue, and that means that they got riboflavin deficiency, that vitamin. And then, if a person has a real, real, uh, uh, pale tongue, or, and they got, uh, an iron deficiency, and if they got a beefy red colored tongue, it's caused by vitamin B complex deficiency. So beefy red tongue is vitamin B complex deficiency. A pale tongue is iron deficiency. And then uh, uh, a purple or magenta, you know, like almost tongue is riboflavin. So, um... I think uh, uh, people with, uh, be there have been chances and times when people have had uh, 
what you can call um, nutritional bariatric surgeries and stuff like that. And they have to eat small, dense meals, uh, take a lot of vitamins and supplements, and um, they have to avoid eating excessively or food that could cause blockage. And that's how they lose their weight. You know, so um, you don't they you 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 tell them if they had like a bypass or something to make sure that they avoid big chunks of food and they eat little small little meals because they don't want to stretch out or obstruct that little pouch because a lot of times they take out a lot of the intestines and they don't have. Uh, or their stomach and intestines and stuff, and they don't have as much to uh, digest as uh, they did before. But a lot of times what happens is, um, you know, they they have a habit, you know. So make sure you obtain a health history. Get the uh, dietary history. You want to inspect their skin, her eyes, their mouth, their nails, their musculoskeletal and neurological signs. And uh, you're going to do their height and BMI uh, and laboratory tests. And then you're going to do teaching. And I always tell students to always teach them something. I don't care how simple you think it is, always tell them something. You have a person that had a, a gastric bypass or something, always leave with something. You know, you might tell them, okay, now remember you're supposed to just eat little bitty meals, avoid this, avoid that. You know, just that's enough. That's enough teaching you know, uh, for them. Okay. So, uh, that'll be it. Um, that's the end. Uh, I hope everybody understood everything. Okay. Uh, anything that you have any problems with that I said, believe me, you guys, it'll be right in the book. Uh, as far as the BMIs and the weight changes and that type of stuff, I saw where one book had 19, one book had 18. Believe me, I'm going to make sure on the exam that it's clear. Thanks. Okay, everybody have a good evening.